Let's talk about the rare and exoteric technical horrors that the Necrons can awaken from the Tomb Worlds. Today we're talking Gauss Pythons and Tesseract Arcs as we look at the Forge World Necron range. Hello and welcome back to Warspex Tactics, the strategy focused 40k channel where we're all about getting the most out of our miniatures on the tabletop. In today's video we're looking over the entire Necron Forge World range, from Tomb Sentinels to Night Shrouds, talking through each one of their data sheets and how they stack up against the Codex options. Plenty of interesting stuff here and some much lesser seen units for the Necrons, so let's jump right in and look at some strange Canoptic creations first. First up we come to the Canoptic Tomb Stalker, a centipede like Canoptic creation which is equipped with an incredibly powerful sensor array on its front. This thing can detect the heartbeat of a living organism through hundreds of meters of solid rock. Tomb Stalkers are exceptionally hardy, their body segments are made of living metal and their interlocking segments can regenerate with ease if they take heavy battle damage. Rules wise it's an elite's choice for Codex Necrons, 90 points, a 10 inch movement, weapon skill and ballistic skill 4, strength 6, toughness 7, 9 wounds, 6 attacks, leadership 10 and a 3 plus save. As Canoptic creations go it is a fairly big one. It's equipped with 2 Gauss slicers, they're both 24 inch range rapid fire 2 weapons, strength 5, AP minus 1 and damage 1. So that's a fairly hefty 8 quality anti-infantry shots when it's up close and personal. In melee it's equipped with Tombstalker Claws that makes its strength up to 7, AP minus 2 and damage 2 and it gets 6 attacks so it's sort of not all that different from a Canoptic Wraith. In addition it gets a Gloom Prism included in the cost, that's basically the same as the Tomb Spider one giving you the chance to do a Deny the Witch, very useful. And it has the usual living metal command protocols and it can also use dimensional translocation, teleporting into the foe and guaranteeing that you're getting at least one round of fire off and having the chance to charge. I suspect that Novot might be a fairly good fit for it given the extra plus one to charge after it's translocated but to be honest I don't really see this one stacking up all that well against Canoptic Spiders. It's a little bit tougher than Spiders for the points but the equivalent points cost in Spiders will pack quite a bit more melee and potentially more shooting too if you give it the particle casters. Spiders aren't bad, but they're not exactly the most competitive choice for the Necrons, and it's probably not all that helpful that it doesn't compare amazingly to them. The next Canoptic creation are the Canoptic Acanthrites. These are perhaps sort of similar to Wraiths in appearance, 12 inch movement, again weapon skill and ballistic skill 4 plus, strength and toughness 5, 3 wounds, 2 attacks, leadership 10 and a 3 plus save. They don't get the nice 4 plus invul save of the Wraiths, but they do get a rule called Shadowed Wings, which means they're minus 1 to hit at range. In the background these are vanguard war constructs, much feared by enemy tank commanders due to their cutting beam attacks which have essentially the exact same profile as melter guns, damage d6 or d6 plus 2 when you're within half range. In melee compared with the wraith's claws these guys get void blades, so 3 strength 5 attacks with ap minus 3 and damage 1. Again I would say that these are probably outshone by the codex options, the wraiths hit far harder in melee and of course they're a lot harder to shift with that invul and are also a bit cheaper to boot. The cutting beam attacks are kind of okay, but at 40 points per model only hitting on a 4 plus really isn't all that great. I'm afraid in any sort of competitive list I just really don't see these guys doing a lot at all. I'd much rather take Wraiths or Scorpec Destroyers, they just seem to have more damage output for the points. Next up we come to the Canoptic Tomb Sentinel, who is a fast attack choice of the Tomb Stalker. And in the lore he basically is a Tomb Stalker, who packs an exile weapon, a potent close range weapon that can destroy virtually any target. He gets basically the same profile as the Tomb Stalker, except he costs a little bit more at 125 points and he only gets 4 attacks rather than 6. What you're really paying for is upgrading those Gauss weapons to the Exile Cannon, which is an 18 inch heavy D6 gun at a whopping strength 10, AP minus 4, damage 3 and the blast keyword. In a way this guy seems fairly close in profile to the Canoptic Doom Stalker. That Exile Cannon will have a similar damage output but being far more reliable against 3 wound infantry. The difference is rather than being a static platform that fires at extreme range, this one's a short ranged one but can move and fire freely. Again it also gets a gloom prism for a nice little bit of psychic defence and it can also deep strike into the enemy for a first strike on them. I feel like as the Necron Forge World choices go this might be one of the better ones. I could imagine a trio of these being a real big threat to deal with, particularly if combined with a Technomancer with a Canoptic Control node allowing them to all hit on threes. Certainly pretty pricey but at least they're fairly tough and unlike Doomstalkers you can both move them and they'll have at least some threat in melee. Moving on we come to the Necron Forge World Bomber and this is the Night Shroud. 
a Necron tactical bomber from the War in Heaven equipped with the fearsome Death Spears. It costs 190 points for the model, and the profile's pretty much the same as the Night Scythe or Doom Scythe, except you get 14 wounds rather than 12. Like the Night Scythe and Doom Scythe, it's armed with a twin Tesla Destructor, and in addition to that, it has its Death Sphere Bombardment Armament, which is interesting, though I think it's a bit underwhelming because it's only a once per battle bomb. Much like quite a few other bomber special rules, you can nominate one unit that it's moved over and deal a bunch of mortal wounds to that unit, rolling 3d6 for every vehicle or monster as part of the unit, or 1d6 per model up to 12d6, and for each roll of 3 that unit takes one mortal wound. That means this thing is likely to do around about 8 mortal wounds to a suitably large infantry squad, so it can potentially pack a fearsome punch, but essentially after that all you have is a fancy knight scythe that you've paid a fair few more points for. I think it's really going to depend on the matchup whether that bomb's actually going to be all that much use. Against some armies with juicy targets of high value one wound infantry, certainly worth it. Against other armies with really elite infantry or hordes that don't really care about losing a few bodies, maybe not so much. I don't think it's particularly bad, but I would prefer the Doom Scythe myself. At least that's got a powerful anti tank weapon that can fire every single turn rather than being a one hit wonder, then gone. Next up, we come to the Tesseract arc which is a heavy support choice, and this one's a Necron Siege arc that bears a compressed singularity of energy in a Tesseract, but the Adeptus Mechanicus a fairly sure breaks the laws of physics. It can unleash that stored energy in devastating blast, cutting through anything foolish enough to stand in its way. The arc's a heavy support choice, and costs between 170 and 200 points, depending on what secondary armament you give it. It's got a 12-inch movement, so quite fast, Ballistic Skill 3+, Strength 5, Toughness 7, 10 wounds and a 3 plus save. Compared with the similarly priced Doomsday Arc, it's got far less wounds at only 10 rather than 14, but its quantum shielding has an improved 4 plus invul save, and it does get toughness 7 as well for what it's worth. That Tesseract Singularity Chamber can be unleashed in three different ways. A Particle Hurricane, which is essentially a 12 inch flamer weapon, that's got strength 4, AP minus 3 and damage 1, but it always wounds non-vehicle targets on the roll of a 2 plus. Probably not the one that you're most going to want to fire, but could cut through some infantry in a pinch. The other two options are 24 inch range seismic lash, which is an anti elites option, assault d6, strength 5, AP minus 3, and damage 3, maybe quite good for killing 3 wound infantry. And finally, its main anti tank variant, solar fire, which gives you a 36 inch shot at heavy d6, strength 8, AP minus 3, and damage d6. If you compare this profile to the Doomsday arc, you do lose a couple of pips of strength and a little bit of AP, but this guy can fire it when it's moving very quickly around the battlefield, which is quite a nice upside. For the secondary weapons, you can either take Particle Beamers, they're free and they'd be 12 shots at strength 5, or you can pay 10 points each to upgrade to Tesla Cannons, or 15 points each to upgrade to Gauss Cannons. I think all of these can work to be honest, and I'd be quite interested in the Gauss Cannons myself to be honest, they're a good generalist profile that's particularly good at cutting through 3 wound Space Marines. Overall, I think that this guy does compete at least fairly decently with the Doomsday Arc, giving up a little bit of damage output for a whole load of mobility, plus the secondary weapons maybe gel a bit more with the gun platform, as opposed to those Gauss Flare arrays, which really want you to get very close. Next up, let's take a look at the Necron Pylons. This first one is the Sentry Pylon, the smaller of the two, and these are autonomous point defence structures with a heavy presence on Tomb Worlds, that the Necrons can teleport them into battle if needed. The Sentry Pylon is an 100 point model, it's got a Ballistic Skill 3 plus, Toughness 7, 8 wounds and a 3 plus save, so at least fairly durable, and you can choose one of three different weapons to equip it with. The Focus Death Ray is a single shot at strength 12, AP minus 4 and damage D3 plus 3. I'm afraid a single shot just really doesn't cut it at 100 points, even if it is a good one. If you're not upgrading to the Heat Cannon, then I'd say the Gauss Exterminator is the better of the 100 point options, with two strength 8 shots at 48 inch range, AP minus 3, and damage D6. It also gets a small bonus against aircraft as well, getting plus 2 to hit against them. I'd say this one's better, there's still nothing absolutely enormous to write home about. Probably my favourite loadout for the Sentry Pylon is the most expensive one, the Heat Cannon for an extra 25 points, as at least this one does have the potential to do some serious damage if you roll well. It's a 36 inch range, heavy D6 weapon, with strength 8, AP minus 4, and damage D6, and if it happens to be within half range, then you also get the Melter special rule, getting D6 plus 2 damage. As a fortification, it certainly does have some issues. 
It can sometimes be a pain to deploy when you're putting it three inches away from other terrain pieces, and as it's a mobile, that means it can't fall back, so your opponent could potentially protect yourself from your own shooting by attacking it in combat. I guess the teleportation matrix rule does kind of make up for that. That means that it can be teleported into battle with dimensional translocation, so at least if you're firing with the 36-inch range heat ray, you are at least pretty much guaranteed a hefty strike, potentially even within 18-inch range if you want to. If you do, and you manage to target a Toughness 7 vehicle, for example, then you do average a fairly whopping 7 wounds out of the heat ray on the turn that it comes in. As Necron firepower goes, that's really quite efficient. But then you do have the disadvantage of having put down a model that can easily be tagged and locked up. Despite that, I do think that these things are potentially quite playable. You might just have to use them in the right list, say perhaps a very melee heavy Necron list, so if your opponent tries to lock them up, then you can charge them with your own melee units. Next, we move on to the Lords of War, and we have the Sentry Pylon's bigger brother, the Gauss Pylon. It's a pretty enormous gun platform, in the background capable of laying a waste to entire formations, and in game it'll cost you 475 points, and is a Ballistic Skill 3 platform, with a hefty 30 toughness 8 wounds, a save of a 3+, plus, and a 5+, plus invol against ranged attacks. That's really not too bad toughness for the points at all. The Pylon's main weapon is a Gauss Annihilator, and you can choose to fire it in its main anti-tank profile, or its more dispersed flux arc profile. The Focus one has a pretty spectacular 120 inch range, heavy 2d3, strength 16, AP minus 4, and damage d3 plus 6. It's also a blast weapon, and gets that same plus 2 to hit against aircraft that the sentry pylon does. Against most vehicles without invuls, you'll get a couple of wounds through with the average of 4 shots, so they should quite comfortably one-shot most tanks in the game. As for each shot that you get through, you get an average of 8 damage. Obviously it's quite a good target for things like command rerolls, rerolling a wound roll on this could translate into a lot of extra wounds. Its secondary profile are the flux arcs, they're only 30 inch range, a bit more of a point defence type thing, and that's rapid fire 6, strength 6, AP minus 2, and damage 2. Not too bad against clearing out a few space marines, though certainly not worth the 475 point price tag. Finally, if anyone tries to engage it in melee and lock it up, it does attack with a Tesla arc, it's a 3 inch range shooting weapon, assault 3d6, strength 4, AP 0 and damage 1, and it has the usual Tesla rule where you get extra hits on 6s. Finally, the pylon does have a few extra special rules, it can use dimensional translocation the same as the sentry pylon, though it's a bit painful to try and keep 475 points worth of firepower off the board for a turn, that could be crucial, and it also has a phase shift generator, meaning that friendly Necron units receive a 5 plus invul save against ranged attacks, while they're within 6 inches of the model. Could be pretty handy to put next to certain Necron units when they're starting on the board. Turn 1 when they're in range, this could be really helpful for some of your warrior phalanxes, lich guard or scarabs perhaps. On the flip side though, you don't want to be too close to it when it goes down, it explodes on a 5 plus for a big explosion with d6 mortal wounds all around. Overall, I think that the pylon is certainly an interesting model, and kind of one that you'd need to build your army around to make use of. It's a huge investment, costing one quarter of your army, and then some command points on top of that to unlock the super heavy support detachment. On top of that, as it's a mobile, it could be really quite punished in heavy terrain boards, where your opponent could just hide out of line of sight if they care about being shot by it. You also really can't afford to have this thing get locked up by chaff infantry. Sure, it might clear them with that Tesla fire and being able to fire in close combat with the Flux Array, but that could still shut down the shooting for a 475 point model for a turn, which you can't really afford. I think overall, while it's quite fun and very intimidating, the drawbacks do kind of outweigh the positives on this one. Even comparing it to something like a monolith with death rays, the monolith does two more damage per point, albeit at a slightly shorter range, and can at least move and do some damage in combat too. Probably not the best take or comers option, but at least some armies I think would struggle to handle quite this massive firepower that sat at the back, just deleting one unit per turn. Finally, we get to the Seraptic Heavy Construct, which I have covered in a previous video if you want to see a bit more details. But basically this guy is the ultimate guardian that sits at the centre of Tomb Worlds, guarding the core matrix, but is occasionally summoned forth to battle in dire circumstances by the most aggressive and reckless overlords. It's another Lord of War choice at 650 points, and it has a very similar profile to an Imperial Knight, 12 inch movement, weapon skill and ballistic skill 3, strength and toughness 8, 28 wounds, 6 attacks, leadership 10 and a 3 plus save, and it also has a 5 plus invulnerable save from its containment field. The Seraptek is armed with titanic forelimbs and two singularity generators, 
though you can swap out those singularities for the combination of two synaptic disintegrators and two transdimensional projectors. The singularity weapons are essentially two massive anti-tank weapons, 36 inches heavy 3d3, strength 8, AB-3 and damage D6, or maybe average you about 16 wounds against a toughness 7 vehicle. They're nice generalist weapons, but I do quite like the combination of the other two. The synaptic obliterators are heavy D3 weapons with 72 inches, and are massively dedicated anti-tank weapons with strength 16, AP-4 and a flat damage 6. Against hard targets, they'll basically do you the exact same damage as the singularity generators, and you get those two bonus transdimensional projectors as well. 24 inch range heavy D6 weapons with strength 6, AP-2 and damage 1. At least good for a bit of general purpose anti-infantry threat. I think both the loadouts are fine, though I might be tempted by the synaptic obliterators and projectors myself. It also has pretty reasonable melee threat. The titanic forelimbs can either strike at strength 16, AP-3 and damage 5. Again, should be good to handle most hard targets in a single round of combat. Or if you're against infantry, you can strike at strength 8, AP-1 and damage 2 at a big 12 attacks. Overall, despite the pretty impressive numbers that this thing does throw around, unfortunately it's just not really all that great for the 650 points. Again, you'd most likely be better off with two monoliths than this, or just 650 points of the most efficient Necron units that you can find. Really cool model that's a bit let down by the rules, but I'm sure with that stat line it'd still be really quite good fun to use in-game. So I hope you've enjoyed a brief tour around the Necron Forge World models. Out of all the ones that we've talked about, my favourites are the sentry pylons with the deep striking heat rays, the tomb sentinels with their close range exile weapons, and the tesseract arcs with their fast moving singularity generators, all of which provide quite interesting anti-tank fire support choices for the Necrons, and they're potentially worth weighing up in comparison to doomstalkers or doomsday arcs. In any case, let me know what you think of the units down in the comments below. I'd certainly be interested to hear if you've ran any of these guys in lists in 9th edition and any of your real world battlefield experiences. If you've enjoyed the video, then feel free to subscribe to All Specs Tactics, where I certainly like to keep these strategy review videos coming, and I'm sure there'll be plenty more videos for the Necrons on the way. Finally, if you have been enjoying all the videos on the channel and you'd like to help keep them coming, I would just like to mention that I do have a Patreon page, which you can find down in the video description. Making all these videos does take a fair amount of time, so if you are enjoying regularly, then any support is massively appreciated. I do try and reward people as best I can for backing the channel, so you get to see certain videos early, there are regular votes to see what sort of things happen next, and each month everyone's entered into a monthly prize giveaway with a chance to win some massive model kits. If any of that sounds good to you, or you'd just like to help support the channel, then the link is down in the video description below. In any case though, a massive thank you for listening, and I'll hope to see you guys next time.